Who are the two witnesses? It's a title of the sermon. In fact, I haven't really been talking about the subject for three years. I thought I would have done this more frequently. So it's high time, I guess, to go back into this very question. And what I'd like to do at the beginning, and you should all be familiar with the report on the two witnesses, which you find in Revelation chapter 11. I don't intend to read the entire chapter, but I will hit some highlights. But I'd like to quote to a large extent today from our booklet on the mysteries of the book of Revelation. Now, if you haven't read that booklet for a while, I'd recommend you do so. And of course, in chapter 11, we first of all start talking about the temple of God. And we say in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, John is asked to measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but to leave out the court, which is outside the temple, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And we say then that a physical temple in Jerusalem is going to be built prior to Christ's return. Now, some dispute that. Some say, no, no, this temple is just a reference to the church of God. It's not talking about a physical temple. And then they try to spiritualize everything away, which is written in the book of Revelation. They even go so far as to say that the heavenly Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven to the new earth, that's just a spiritual description of the church. It's no really a city there, even though the Bible continuously speaks about a city Abraham, for instance, was waiting for. When he talks about the fact that John is asked to measure the temple of God. The word for measure is without any exception when it refers to some kind of a building applied to a very literal measuring. You read about here measuring the temple. You read about measuring the city. You read about measuring the wall. You read about measuring Jerusalem. These are all very real pieces of conduct and courses of conduct to measure something which is physical. It could also be spiritual when it comes to the New Jerusalem because that's also going to be measured, but it's something there. It's not talking about symbolically about the church, at least not only. So this is already a hint to understand that we are talking about a real temple which is going to be measured. We say in our booklet, when Christ was asked by the disciples what would be the sign of his coming and of the end of the age, he referred to the great tribulation and at the same time the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Mark says, for it ought not. In Luke 21, in the parallel account, Christ is quoted as saying, but when you see Jerusalem, surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. From these passages, we see that the abomination of desolation refers to foreign armies that will make Jerusalem a desolate place, but more is involved because Christ talks about the prophecies of Daniel. And when it comes to Daniel, we read in Daniel chapter 11 that a king of the north shall muster forces, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and then they shall take away the daily sacrifices, and notice, and they will place there the abomination of desolation. They will place it there. Daniel 11 verse 31 tells us that. And Daniel 12 and verse 11 goes on to say, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, this talks more than just armies, right? Something else is being described here. And so if we go back to what actually happened at the time when this was given as a forerunner under Antiochus Epiphanes, that's what he did. That's what he did. And the Nelson Study Bible points out. Antiochus polluted the altar by offering a pig upon it. He declared the daily sacrifices and other ceremonies illegal. 
and committed an abomination of desolation by what? By erecting an image of Zeus in the holy place. Jesus said a similar thing would happen not, uh, prior to his return. So again, it necessitates a temple. Of course, there's more as to why we are saying this, because yes, it's true. The temple of God can refer to the New Testament church, but not in this context, at least not completely and totally, insofar as the measurement of the city is concerned in Revelation 11. Because we also read that it's not given to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles will tread the holy city underfoot for three and a half years. And the court, which is outside the temple, will be given to those Gentiles. Now, this talks about the fact that the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled when all of that is said and done. They will tread the holy city underfoot, it says in Luke, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So apparently, with the end of the three and a half years, the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Now, if you again very closely look at Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, a distinction is made between the temple and those who worship there. So if the church is a temple, that distinction makes no sense. And that's why many feel it couldn't be just talking about a spiritual temple, because it's talking to more than, about more than that. Of course, the most prominent and important scripture, and there are many actually, but the one I'd like to quickly talk about is what is talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because there we read that a man of sin is going to stand in the temple of God, saying that he is God, and he will deceive the many. Now, some have said, oh yeah, this is going to be a leader in God's church, and he is going to stand up, and he is going to be the man of sin, and then he is going to be in the church of God. Well, first of all, that wouldn't have such a tremendous impact on the world as this passage in 2 Thessalonians is referring to. And then when Mr. Armstrong died and Mr. Descartes came to power, some said, oh yeah, well, he is that man of sin. He is going to be in the temple of God claiming to be God. Now, first of all, he never claimed to be God. Secondly, he didn't perform any miracles, so it wasn't him. It's very difficult to get that picture in your mind that a person in the church of God would then rise, claiming to be God in that temple, and they will all follow him. The Riley Study Bible says about this passage, and of course it calls this man of sin the Antichrist, which is kind of a false designation, but nevertheless, he will, he will desecrate the rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem by placing himself there to be worshipped. This will be the climax of man's great sin of self-deification de in open defiance of God. The Nelson Study Bible adds, the man of sin will proclaim himself to be divine, will sit in the temple of God, acting as if he were a god. The man of sin will probably stand in a physical temple in Jerusalem and declare himself to be a god, the ultimate fulfillment of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. So the point is, this temple will be terribly polluted. And we read in the book of Ezekiel, after Christ's return, that that temple, which then is being described, has to be purified. It has to be purified because it was polluted. And so the pollution is being described right here. The man of sin, a statue is going to be erected, probably one of the Virgin Mary or maybe of a false Christ, and people will actually worship that statue, like many already are worshiping statues today. And Maybe that statue even will, give, will be given the power by Satan to speak and give commands, as some indications might suggest. Whatever it may be, it presupposes a literal temple. And so that's why we have been very clearly concluding that a temple is going to be built. And everything which is happening in the Middle East right now, and so far as the Temple Mount is concerned, is of great importance. Because if the third temple is going to be built, where the second temple stood and the first temple stood, then you have a problem with the Al-Aqsa Mosque because apparently it stands right there. And somehow it has to be removed. And um, 
we'll have to wait and see how this is going to come about. After we are in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, introduced to the measurement of the temple, we are then introduced to the two witnesses in verse 3. And of course, beginning with verse 3, you know the story, I would suppose. We are being told that two witnesses will prophesy for 1,260 days or three and a half years. And that will ha apparently happen at the same time when certain church members will be at a place of safety here on earth to be protected from the beast of the false prophet because the same time element is given there for that period. Now in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 4, the two witnesses are referred to as the two olive trees and the two lampstands. And of course, this is an obvious reference to the passage or some passages in Zechariah chapter 4. Now, this seems to be talking about two people. Now, those who are trying to spiritualize all of that away, they say, oh no, it's just symbolic for the law and the prophets. Not two people. Or they say, oh no, it's just a symbolic description of the church as a whole. Now, if it's the church as a whole, why are there two <laughs> witnesses mentioned? No, no, these are two people. And many do agree that these are actually two literal personalities, but then, of course, there is a big debate as to who they are. Some say, oh, these are angels, angels from heaven, and they are going to preach then as the two witnesses, and at the end of that time, they will be killed. Now, the problem, of course, is angels are spirit beings who cannot die. Then they say, oh, yeah, but they are going to be changed into human beings, and then they're going to be killed. You think so? You think that angels will then become human beings to be killed. And then they are going to be resurrected as angels again. And then we are going to rule over angels, so we are going to rule over the two witnesses. I mean, this makes little sense. So others say, well, no, these are not angels. These are going to be personalities. But the personalities they recommend are Moses or Elijah or Enoch. And uh, some even mention Jeremiah, but that is not so much popular anymore. But Moses, Elijah, Enoch. They say they will be either resurrected from the dead, or they have been kept alive for thousands of years in a state of limbo. In a sense, right into the hands of the Catholic Church they fall. And saying that. Now, let me just say, before I go more deeply into discussing this a little bit, Moses died. We know that he died. See, God buried him. The bones cannot be found. I mean, Satan wanted to actually reveal where those bones were, and he fought with Michael, the archangel Michael, and Michael prevented him from doing so. The Bible says, as we will see in a moment, that Moses will be resurrected from the dead it's a time of Christ's second coming, not before then. And Elijah and Enoch also died. And they obeyed the resurrection from the dead. That's what the Bible says. That's not what commentaries say. I took the time, normally I don't really want to waste the time, but I, I thought, well, let me look into how people come to this conclusion. Because we always have found that if you come to a wrong conclusion, you are starting with the wrong premise. So what's the wrong premise? In the commentary by God Questions, they say this. There are three primary theories on the identity of the two witnesses in Revelation. One, Moses and Elijah. Two, Enoch and Elijah. And three, two unknown believers whom God calls to be his witnesses in the end times. One, Moses and Elijah are seen as possibilities for the two witnesses due to the specific miracles that John says the witnesses will perform. Also giving strength to this view is the fact that Moses and Elijah both appeared with Jesus at the Transfiguration. Further, Jewish tradition expects Moses and Elijah to return based on the prophecy of Elijah's coming in Malachi chapter 4 
and God's promise to raise up a prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy, which some Jews believe necessitates Moses' return. Let me just say this. If God raises a prophet like Moses, it's not Moses. I mean, that's already completely contradictory. The transfiguration on the mount was a preview of what would happen in the kingdom of God. It doesn't talk about the time here and now. And frankly, what Jewish tradition has to say about this is of little consequence and relevance. They go on, number two. Enoch and Elijah are seen as possibilities for the two witnesses because of the unique circumstances surrounding the exit from the world. Enoch and Elijah, as far as we know, are the only two individuals whom God has taken directly to heaven without experiencing death. Proponents of this view point to Hebrews 9.27, which says that all men are appointed to die once. The fact that neither Enoch nor Elijah have yet experienced death seems to qualify them for the job of the two witnesses who will be killed when the job is done. And then third, two unknowns are seen as possibilities for the two witnesses because of the lack of specificity in Revelation 11. Scripture does not identify the two witnesses by name, and no well-known person is associated with their coming. Well, of course not, because at that time when John wrote it, the people didn't even exist yet, and why should they be identified by name? I mean, even the beast and the false prophet are not identified by name, but we know they're going to exist. It gets even more advantageous, or adventurous, I should say, in this article by idisciple.org. The possible weakness of one, the first explanation, is that Moses has already died once, and therefore could not be one of the two witnesses who die, which would make Moses a contradiction of Hebrews 9, verse 27. But proponents of one will argue that all of the people who were miraculously resurrected in the Bible, for instance, Lazarus, later died again. And so Hebrews 9, 27 is viewed then as a general rule, not a universal principle. Somebody comes to you with that kind of an argument, what would your response be? And then they go on to say there are no clear weaknesses to number two, in other words, Elijah and Enoch, as it solves the die once problem, and it makes sense that God, that if God took two people to heaven without dying, Enoch and Elijah, it was to prepare them for a special purpose, in other words, to die again, or to die. There also is no clear weakness to view number three, in other words, two people in the end time church will be the two witnesses. And then before I go into discussing this a little, Crosswalk.com writes, many church fathers, now here we go, the Catholic church fathers have taught that. Now that should already ring a bell of alarm. Many church fathers held the view that Enoch and Elijah, having never experienced death, form the identities of the two witnesses. Enoch and Elijah never perished here on earth. Perhaps God will allow them to enter earth as the two witnesses and experience death at the hands of the beast, showing that no man can escape a physical death. So that's the argument. Well, of course, they're all wrong. Why are they wrong? They are wrong because the Bible says that Enoch did die. I mean, he did experience death. He was transferred from one place of the earth to another place on the earth. To escape death, it says, talking about the second death, talking perhaps about the death at that moment to be protected from violence. But he did die. How do, how do we know that? Hebrews chapter 11. Let's turn to that passage. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. So the idea like that never experienced death is just blatantly wrong. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. By faith, Enoch was transferred to that he didn't see death. Talking about the second death, talking about potentially physical death at that time. And wasn't found, but of course not where he was, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But is that the end of the story? No. Because it goes on at verse 13, these all died in faith. All those who are being listed here, including Enoch, died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off, they assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So they died. So Enoch died. Now Elijah, Elijah also died because the Bible says that he didn't go to heaven. 
Now, we read that she was transferred to heaven, right, in a, in a, in a tempest and in wind and storm, but it wasn't the third heaven where God is. Because otherwise, John 3 and verse 13, would Jesus Christ make a lie? If Elijah went to heaven, the heaven where God is, then Jesus Christ didn't tell us the truth. Because he says in John chapter 3, and in verse 13, that no one has ascended to heaven. That includes Enoch, that includes Elijah. No one ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, and that is the Son of Man. Jesus Christ, the only one. So therefore, they did die, they didn't go to heaven. And we also read that Moses is waiting for the resurrection of the dead to eternal life, not a physical existence. You know, he, he was Christ's. We read, and you might want to look at this later. Well, I'm going to read in a moment. He had God's Holy Spirit. He was a true Christian. We read that as a true Christian, you will be resurrected to immortal life when Christ returns. First Corinthians chapter 15 tells you that. What they're talking about is people like Lazarus. They say, oh yeah, but he died, but he was resurrected again. You see, Lazarus was not a converted Christian yet. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. Nobody in the Bible was ever resurrected as a true Christian when he died as a true Christian before Christ returned. Nobody, except, of course, for Christ himself. So this is not a valid argument. And in Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 11, you read very clearly that Moses had God's Holy Spirit. Let me read it to you from the authorized version, Isaiah 63, verse 11. Then he, God, remembered the days of old, Moses and his people. Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Very clearly, Moses had the Holy Spirit. Now think in terms of the consequences otherwise. I mean, here we have people who have made it. Whether it's Moses, Elijah, Enoch, they are going to be resurrected to a physical existence, even though they had made it, with a chance to fail, because every time you have a human being, you can fail. You think that God would actually take that kind of a risk, in quotes? I mean, here is Moses. He is falling asleep. Enoch falling asleep. Enoch, uh, I mean, Elijah falling asleep, convinced that within the next second of their consciousness, they're going to be in the kingdom of God. So they are being awakened as physical beings. They say, well, what's this? What happens? No, they had no memory, no, 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 no thinking. They didn't know what was happening. So now, first of all, God would have to explain to them what he expects of them. It is just a ridiculous, stupid comment and concept and idea. But this is what most commentaries will tell you. Elijah, Enoch, Moses, these are the three huge, big candidates. Now, Unger's Bible Handbook points out, although the two witnesses are commonly identified as Moses and Enoch, or Moses and Elijah, such identifications are scarcely tenable. These witnesses are evidently two members of the Latter-day Remnant, and that's the most logical explanation. After they die, we read, they will be resurrected but not as physical beings. They will be resurrected and ascend to heaven in a cloud. It happens at the end of the second woe, the beginning of the third and final woe, which is when the seventh angel blows the trumpet. In other words, it will take place when the resurrection of the saints of God will take place, and then they will meet Christ in a cloud when he returns. That's exactly the picture we have insofar as the two witnesses are concerned. We say in our booklet that although the powers described remind us of acts performed by Moses and Elijah, it is not necessary to assume that John expected them to return literally, and we're quoting here by this comment by the Broadman Bible Commentary. You know, Christ said about John the Baptist that he was Elijah. But at the same time, it was also clear that he came with the power and the spirit of Elijah, with the same kind of power. 
When it says in the book of Malachi that God will send Elijah, it's not talking about the Elijah who died. It's talking about somebody who will come with the power and the spirit of Elijah to bring about what is being proclaimed. People, of course, don't seem to understand that. And they take it little. And of course, if it takes a, it take a little, you have a problem because, you know, John the Baptist himself even said, I'm not Elijah. So he didn't know that he was Elijah. No, he didn't believe it because he wasn't. But he came with the power and the spirit of Elijah. In a Q&A, we pointed out that there are so many who claim today that there are the two witnesses. It says one is claiming that he and his wife are the two witnesses. Problem is, they are called prophets in Revelation chapter 11. And after the New Testament church was founded, you will not find that any woman had the office of prophet. Now, of course, there are incidents where they prophesied. But here we're talking about ordained prophets. And unless God changes all of that when it comes to the two witnesses, there is no indication in the Bible that a woman will have the office of prophet in the New Testament church up until the time of Christ's return. So that's problem number one for those who claim that the couple, wife and husband together, are going to be the two witnesses. Now, there's one situation I was told that somebody said, my dad and I are the two witnesses. Well, I don't want to identify those people because I don't think they are. But uh, the father did not ever repudiate that comment by his son. There's another one in another organization who's saying, well, I am not the two witnesses, but I am training the two witnesses under me so that they can fulfill their job. Well, you be the judge of that one. But having said that, it's very likely, and I will talk about that some more, that the two witnesses won't act alone, that they will be supported, accompanied by others, because this was always the case. You look at Elijah, you look at Elisha, they had supporters, they are called the sons of the prophets, they were with them. Think of John the Baptist, he had disciples following him, some of them then later followed Jesus Christ. Christ himself had apostles, I'm sorry, had well, apostles too, but he had disciples, male and female, who followed him. And so, we'll talk about that in a moment, but there's nothing to be said about the possibility that the two witnesses wouldn't be followed, supported, accompanied by others in their job. In Revelation chapter 11 at verse 3 it says, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So what this means is they will be given power and authority from God, or the ability from God to do what they need to do. They do throughout these three and a half years, it's the same time frame of the Great Tribulation. And then we read in chapter 11, verse 5, if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. Now, that could be easily misunderstood. This passage doesn't tell us whether the two witnesses will directly cause the death of the enemies or whether, which is much more likely, God will supernaturally intervene and use them as quote-unquote vehicles or quote-unquote instruments to bring about the results. Think about that. And here are people who are trying to kill the two witnesses, and God will intervene and stop it. See, they're not going to act on their own volition, saying, oh, well, you know, I feel like I should now call fire from heaven to devour them, because, you know, remember the two disciples asking Christ whether they should ask for power coming down, a fire coming down from heaven? And Christ says, you don't know what spirit you are of. So we have to look at and see it in context. In Revelation 11 verse 6 it says, These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues, 
as often as they desire. Now, of course, this reminds us of the plagues of Egypt, of course, including the last one, where the firstborn of all people and animals was killed. But you see, Moses pronounced the plagues, but it was still God, not Moses, who carried them out. So again, God will use those two witnesses without any doubt to make those pronunciations, but it's still going to be God who is carrying them out if it was necessary to do so. We're not talking about people here who are so full of power and of this will to create harm and evil that they're just at a whim creating those consequences. No, they are very humble people, and God will use them for that very purposes. Now, we assume that these men are alive today. We assume that because as we also assume, when I say we, maybe I should say I, I assume that. And I also assume that the beast and the false prophet are alive today. Because if they are not alive today, we're talking about, what, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years from now? Hard for me to fashion that and to fathom that. God will inspire them to say the things they need to say through his spirit. And it's important that we understand how God's spirit is defined amongst other things. We just, in the sermonette by, or the first split sermon by Kiel Mitchell, we found out about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and one of which is meekness. Here's another interesting description of what the Holy Spirit is. Revelation 19 and verse 10. It says, and I fell at the feet to worship him. He's talking about an angel here. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And also in John chapter 16, Christ is making a promise to his disciples, his true disciples. John 16 and verse 13. However, when it, it should say, the spirit of truth has come, it will guide you into all truth, for it will not speak on its own authority, but whatever it hears, it will speak and it will tell you things to come. In other words, it's a spirit of prophecy. And so the two prophets will have that spirit of prophecy to be able to tell the world what's happening. And they will give witness. I mean, there are two witnesses. What did I say? The two spirits? I meant the two witnesses have the spirit of prophecy. And they will tell the world what's going to come. And the two witnesses will give witness. That's why they're called witnesses. They will preach the gospel of the kingdom of God as a witness unto all nations. You see, the church of God today has the responsibility to do that. But we also find that the church of God will not stop doing it. Now here, two witnesses within the Church of God will continue doing it, but there's more, as I will point out in a moment. But first we read that the two witnesses are clothed symbolically in sackcloth. We just read that. Now, the Luther Bible says, in clothes of mourning. See, being dressed in sackcloth refers to mourning, refers to sadness. The two witnesses will proclaim the need to mourn. They will proclaim the need to repent. James 4 tells us, cleanse your hands, you sinners, lament and mourn and weep. And of course, in Luke 24, you should all be familiar with these passages, Christ says that repentance and remission of sins will be preached to all nations. That will be part of what the two witnesses will do. But then we have to read carefully some of these things because sometimes we can just gloss over them. So I'd like to turn to Revelation 11 and verse 6 to see exactly what it says here. Revelation 11 and verse 6. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike what? Jerusalem? the state of Israel, because some would have just limited to that area. It doesn't say that. 
they have power to strike the earth, the entire earth, with all plagues as often as they desire, but that desire is based on God's inspiration. So they are the ones who have power, ability to strike the earth with plagues. So the activity is not limited to Jerusalem. We don't read that they are working in Jerusalem here. There's nothing in the Bible talks about the fact that they, for these three and a half years, are living in Jerusalem, working in Jerusalem, operating from Jerusalem. We don't even read that they are killed in Jerusalem. All what we read is that they are going to be, or their dead bodies will be, in the city of Jerusalem, which is called also spiritual Sodom and Egypt, where Christ was crucified, that the bodies will lie there for three and a half days. The bodies. Now, all kinds of possibilities. There might even be longer than three and a half days, because let's look at verse 9, exactly what it says. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. They will see them. Maybe they were dead longer than that. But only for three and a half days, they will see them. Now, of course, they will see them through the technology of the internet and television and all these cell phones we got. In a scripture which could not have been fulfilled maybe 30 or whatever years ago. It can't be fulfilled now because the whole world has access to the internet. The whole world has access to cell phones and all of that to what is happening. So we read that the dead bodies will lie in Jerusalem, which is identified as spiritual Sodom. And we read that the nations will see them lying there for three and a half days, and that they won't allow their dead bodies to be buried. And they will be extremely happy, because they see, oh, well, the beast, maybe the false prophet too, as I will mention in a moment, they were involved in killing them, and so they were the great masters over them, and so they are now on the uh, courts, the place there in Jerusalem, their bodies perhaps begin to decay. And so victory is obtained against two witnesses. Of course, then we read that after they have seen them there for three and a half days, they will be resurrected. As I said earlier, that's the time of the first resurrection. A great earthquake will occur, killing 7,000 people and destroying a tenth of the city of Jerusalem. And the rest in Jerusalem will glorify God because the hour of God's judgment had come. 7,000 people will be killed, but some will then, at that moment at least, glorify God, whether that is true repentance or whether that is just a moment, we don't know. Now in Revelation 11 and verse 7 we read, now, when they have finished their testimony, so God is not going to allow any harm to come to them until they have finished the testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. The meaning of, or the terminology of this statement here, they, he, they or he will make war against them is quite remarkable. Because, you see, he's not the only one was going to make war against true servants of God. If you go with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 21. Daniel 7 and verse 21. And I was watching and the same horn, that's a little horn, that's the, as we understand it, the Catholic Church, which has been responsible for all these decades, centuries, of persecuting God's people in one way or another. And they will do it again. And let's make no mistake, I mean, I know that people are questioning what we are saying about the ten revivals of the Roman Empire and the fact that the last seven revivals are a combination between state and church. And that the last revival is happening right now in Europe. And that there are going to be ten nations or groups of nations under the beast, in combination with the false prophets, who will then come to power, and they will persecute the saints. Some people don't believe that anymore. I've come up with all kinds of ideas as to what Babylon supposedly means. All ridiculous ideas, because you look at history, you look at the records, you look at what happened, 
you look at how the Bible defines it. But here in chapter 7 and verse 21 we read, And I was watching, and the same horn was making war. See, same terminology. Against the saints, and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess a kingdom. So it appears that it's not only the beast who is going to make war, but also the false prophets, the Catholic Church, seems to be involved in one way or another, which makes sense because you see the beast and the false prophet working together hand in hand. So it appears like the false prophet will also be responsible for the death of the two witnesses, which is no surprise because he proclaimed to be God standing in the temple of God. And the two witnesses are saying, no, you're not God. And you have polluted the temple of God. And don't worship this statute called the abomination of desolation. Don't worship the guy. So obviously, the false prophet is not going to be happy to hear what the two witnesses have to say. Now, all of this implies that the two witnesses will not act alone, but others will act with them. The two witnesses might be martyred, or they will be martyred, of course, but they might be married. Nothing speaks against that. And their wives might be with them, as the early apostles had their wives accompany them on their travels. And other church members might be with them as well. Think of Elijah, think of Elisha, John the Baptist, Jesus, others had many who followed and worked with them. Christ told the church, that's important in this context, now that they will not have finished preaching in all the cities of Israel even, before Christ comes back. So there is still a role going beyond just the two witnesses, the two personalities of the two witnesses. So that's why it's highly likely that they will be accompanied by Christians, and then the beast and the false prophet will make war, not just against the two witnesses, but also those who are accompanying them. Now, the two witnesses might be supported by those of Laodicea. See, the, those who have the spirit of Philadelphia will be, for the most part, at the place of safety, but that wouldn't apply to those of Laodicea, who have come to repentance, sin, sincere repentance, who are going to renew their zeal, and we read about the 144,000. We read about the great multitude. See, in other words, they come to repentance too. They will be sealed so that they are not going to be destroyed by the plagues which God will pour out on them, uh, I mean on the world. We don't know exactly how far beyond or before the, the one year, before the day of the Lord starts, they have come to repentance obviously after the Philadelphia group went to the place of safety. But you see, they can be supported by them as well. Probably will be. I mean, I cannot see how the two witnesses will be completely on their own. And here you have 144,000 and the great multitude, and they are on their own. No, they've got to be a combination. And quite frankly, there is a strong possibility that the Philadelphia remnants, being at the place of safety, We'll have some kind of a communication with the two witnesses and the great multitude and the 144,000. And it's also possible, very possible, that not everyone who has God's spirit of Philadelphia will go to the place of safety because God has something else for them in mind and he wants to see them helping the two witnesses, you know, because the two witnesses obviously also have the spirit of Philadelphia. They're not going to be at the place of safety. So the bottom line is, they are all going to be still doing the work. Because you see, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God will never end. It won't end. I realize it talks about there's a famine coming, a famine for the word, but it doesn't mean that the church won't preach it, don't preach the truth. What it means is that the people will not recognize it, at least not for a while. So, Remember that the true disciples of Christ will not even have come to all the cities of Israel when Christ returns. And Christ says, blessed is the one who is doing 
the work when I come. Who are the two witnesses? They will be ordained prophets and apostles. They will give a last warning message to prepare for the return of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth. They will proclaim the need for repentance and change. And only the elect will recognize them as to what they really will be, two godly ordained righteous servants of Christ. Now I have come now to the end of my sermon, but before I close, I know you are very curious to find out whether we think we know who the two witnesses are, what their names are. And so, the names of the two witnesses are The names of the two witnesses are to be revealed in the future.